you know, what really kind of pushed me forward was um, just the deep love that I felt for my pets. And I, I, when I would lose one, as we were just saying, you know, it would just completely devastate me. And I knew that there had to be something more to, to what happens after they leave. And so that was my original um, focus was to discover more, find out more so that I could be closer to my own pets and understand them on a higher and more spiritual level and really try to understand why it is that some of our pets, like you said, they're like children to us, but some of them are so deeply, deeply connected to us. There, there really aren't words to describe that connection. It goes far beyond a, a human relationship. You know, it's, oh, it's yes. on a much deeper level. So that's what really propelled me forward on my journey. And then I kind of fell into it because as I was a, a police officer, then everything crazy started happening. So it was a combination of things. First, it's my love of animals and wanting to understand them on a higher and more spiritual level. And then my own intuition decided to kick in. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you were working as a, uh, as a police officer, before uh, we read in your book about your experiences with the animals in that, in that job, I suppose, did you have any idea if, that you could, you could communicate with animals? Did you believe in anything spiritual before then? I did. I had just started my journey remembering that I could do this because I could always understand them as a kid, but it was never on this level. You know, it was on a much uh, simpler level. And I was remembering that I could do this. So I had to kind of peel away the layers of being an adult and being told that, no, that's not possible. No, that's not real. And I didn't have a very good support system. My family, my friends, they all thought I was nuts. So nobody supported me. Nobody, I had no one to talk to about it. And back when I started back in the 90s, you know, the internet was really still kind of new. And I'd go to a bookstore and there'd be like three books in there. And none of them were about animal communication. They were about, you know, psychic readings or tarot cards or astrology or something completely off the topic. So I really found this thirst that I had to find out as much as I possibly could. So um, I had, the interest was there but I didn't know anything about it. I came into it completely blindsided and I discovered it literally one session at a time, everything started to unfold and it was quite amazing at times. Mm. So what, what is it um, with your experiences that make you believe that what you're doing is actually you know, communicating with animals as opposed to as many people would say, it, it's imagination or it's a mixture of, of these kind of things? You know, if I had if I had a dollar for every time somebody said to me, there's no way anybody knew that except my pet and I, <laughs> I would be the richest woman in the world right now because when the messages come through, they are undeniable. Uh, they are absolutely proof that there's no one else in the world who knew those two things. These are, these are things, instances, situations, thoughts that occur only between the person and their pet. And sometimes the, the person that I'm doing the session for, it's just a thought in their mind that they have about their pet. They haven't even vocalized it or verbalized it. And we're both sitting there in awe going, how can this be? How can this happen? But it happens. And that's what's so amazing about it is the, the proof comes from the validations from the clients that I do the sessions for. They're the ones that say to me, nobody else knew this. I didn't tell anyone. I never said that out loud. I never shared that with anyone. That's where the proof is. So it's not quite you know, scientific proof, if that's what somebody is looking for, but the nature of animal communication is not, it has some science behind it, actually, but it's a little bit different than like writing a, a paper on 
you yeah. know, a medical issue course, or something yeah. like that. It sounds very similar to uh, the process of, of mediumship with uh, humans that have passed on um, in terms of you can get verifi uh, verifiable things that only these people knew. So how, how does, is it is it similar to mediumship for for humans oh, yes. as it is for animals? So how, oh, yeah. because most people would think, well, humans are able to, to communicate, we know that, but animals don't kind of, they don't have the language, they don't have the ability to perceive complex things like we do. So how do they communicate? How, how are you experiencing their communication? That's a that's really a great question. I do address that in the book because it's one of the the most common questions I get. You know, departed humans speak English or they speak whatever you know spoken language. So how is it that a pet that doesn't speak how can they communicate? Well, what I have come to find out, and and you know, I'm just speaking from my own personal experience, and that is there is a translation process that takes place. So for instance, if I open up to prepare for a session before I'm, I even have the client on the phone with me, I do a, a meditation and I just check in with that animal, meaning I open up a place, a space, a door, a window, however you want to call it, a portal for the energy to come through. And then I just write down everything that comes to me, whether it makes sense or not, I just write it all down. And in those sensations, if you will, some are visual, like I'll see something. Some are audible. I'll actually hear a word or a sound or a sentence or a name. And sometimes I'll get a physical response. Like I'll feel the, the love that they have for you. So if I'm doing a session for you, before you even get on the phone, I feel like I love you because I'm feeling the love that your pet has for you. It's that strong. So there, the translation process takes place somewhere in between when the animal sends it and I receive it. And I do believe that that has something to do with our six senses, our psychic abilities, our intuition. But I do believe that it also has something to do with what I call our spirit guides, a team of helpers that we all have that will literally translate the messages to me so that I can understand them. So even if I was talking to, let's say an animal in Japan that has never been around English, everyone around it speaks Japanese, I don't speak Japanese, I could still communicate with that particular pet because in that fraction of a second, there is a translation process that happens. So when I receive that incoming message, it comes to me in a format that I understand. That's the best explanation I can give you. It's, it's quite amazing that it can happen that fast. And until you see it in action, until you actually experience it, it might be a little bit hard to wrap your head around if you're new to the topic of animal communication, but it's what has fascinated me for the last you know, 24 years. And it's what keeps me so, you know, just amazed by the messages that come through. And it's, it's really, you never know what they're gonna say. That's the fun part. You know, I, we can ask them anything. They don't have to answer. They can talk about whatever they want and you never know what they're gonna bring up. Mm. The way that I normally imagine um, communication must take place from human and animal spirit communication would be um, so it, with language. You now we we have a meaning that we want to portray to somebody, and we the only way we really have doing that is language. Um, so I'd imagine from a spiritual point of view, with animals and humans, that kind of that language isn't needed because the meaning is intrinsically felt. You know, the meaning itself is sent, not the translation to to, to show that meaning, but the meaning itself. Does that? Does that make sense? It does make sense. And there's many ways that I can send a message to an animal. Let's say I was doing a reading for you and you wanted to ask, you know, who your pet was with. I can do that in a variety of different ways. I don't know if I'm answering this question right. So correct me if I'm not answering this question. But I can ask that question in various different ways. I can do it quietly in my mind, like a thought. I can do visual imagery and ask a question visually. And I can do a combination of feelings, visual, and um, you know, kind of encapsulate all of that into the message. 
every animal is different. So some are better at receiving messages from me that are more visual and others are better at, uh, at just hearing my thoughts and understanding the words in my head. So I don't know, did I answer that? Yeah, question? kind of. I mean, the, the, I suppose uh, another way of putting it. So if we use that example of, of you sending a message via imagery, um, you so before you send that imagery, you have a meaning that you know you want to portray via those images. So, yes. so in in that sense, that in that imagery is the language. So, is it yes. that a language is required in that sense, or can you just send the meaning directly? If you see what I mean, you can mess up and send them something they don't understand. So you are correct. So, for instance, um, I had a client one time ask me, you know, who was going to be the next president? They wanted to know from their pet. Well, <laughs> here in the United States, that was a big deal. Um, <laughs> animals don't care. No, no. <laughs> so I couldn't get an answer. And even trying to relay that question, can you imagine trying to explain to a cat or a dog or a horse or a bird president of the United States? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> far, far outside of their realms of understanding what that even be would be. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, not something they care about. We got to keep it down on their level about mm. things that they are involved with, being people that yeah. they know, things they understand. Mm. It's like they say, um, if you were to have a chat with, say, if you had an orangutan that could speak English, perfect English, you still wouldn't be understand what they were saying because their points of reference are so far removed from our own. You know, if they you try talk, talking about a presidential situation to an ape, they wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about, even though they could speak perfect English. Uh, so, yes, the meaning behind it can be uh, misconstrued. And that's one of the things that I teach uh, because I, I coach people on how to do this because it's very simple. The steps are very simple. And most people can get the basics in about 15 minutes where the where the real work starts is getting in the accuracy. I can teach most people how to send and receive messages in just a few minutes. but Accuracy comes in time and it comes over practice because not only does your brain have to understand what this incoming message means, but you have to be become very good at relaying information just by thought or by images that are clear and accurate and that don't overwhelm the animal. Most people, when they first start out, they are really excited and they want to learn it really fast and they send way too much information way too fast and the animals just go you know whoa <laughs> too much so you have to really calm yourself center yourself be very peaceful be very quiet energy is powerful a thought is as real as yelling in some cir circumstances so when you just send a simple little thought, the animal can receive it and be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Mm. And, and you can, can imagine you can imagine with our day-to-day -day mind states, it wouldn't just be one thought going through. You'd be bombarding without that lots, level of control. Lots of chatter for sure. Mm. So yes, that you can you can definitely uh, send misinformation. And you know what? That's one of the biggest issues that pet parents, pet guardians. I don't like to call us owners no, because I, I think they own us. If anybody <laughs> owns anybody, <laughs> I think they own us, not, not the other way around. Right. So especially I think cats. For, <laughs> especially cats. So for pet parents, if you're experiencing a behavioral issue, chances are there is a miscommunication going on. And usually it, the problem is with the human, not the animal. And I'll give you a perfect example. Let's say you have a kitty that doesn't want to use the litter box. For whatever reason, there's a million of them. Well, you get frustrated, right? You're like, why isn't kitty using the box? And every time you find a mistake, you get angry. You have to clean it up. Why isn't kitty using the box? And you start to obsess about kitty not using the box. What's that message you're sending out into the universe? Don't use the box, kitty. And you're angry and you're sending out all this frustration. Well, kitty gets all of this and is going, wait a second, you're mad at me. I'm not using the box. You're telling me not to use the box and you're still mad at me. Now I don't know what to do, what's going on. 
If you're having a behavioral issue, start with yourself. Think very clearly. Make sure that your thoughts and your words and your feelings are all in alignment with the goal. So if you want Kitty to use the box, you should be thinking, visualizing, saying, and feeling, Kitty, use the box and picture only that, say only that, send only that imagery out to your kitty. Mm. And if they're not, if it's not using the box, for instance, you're thinking you're not using the box. And even though you want them to use the box, because you're focusing on the fact that they're not, they're receiving that as an instruction to not. Yes. It's misinformation. Kitty is getting confused because of all the conflicting thoughts that are going on in our head. And then we throw in our frustration and that'll stress Kitty out even more. And it could just be a health issue and that hasn't been um, discovered yet causing it. So now Kitty's like, well, I'm trying to tell you there's something wrong with me. I'm trying to tell you I don't feel good. I'm trying to tell you something isn't right and you're getting mad at me. So that's where a lot of the confusion, miscommunication can come in and someone like me can come in and explain to Kitty what's going on, explain to human (laughs) how to align themselves so that there's a clearer line of communication. And you can see sometimes immediate results. You know, I've had sessions in the past where just opening the lines of communication so everybody understands what's going on can resolve some problems really quickly. Others, Others take longer, you know, some issues take longer, but certainly just being very clear can help tremendously because humans, we never stop, right? The thoughts in our head. When do we ever stop? And then we have our our electronic devices and all of the distractions in our life. We never just take a moment to sit quietly with our pet and think about what we want. We usually focus on what we don't want. It's human nature. You know, I don't want my dogs to fight. I don't want my dog to tear up my carpet while I'm gone. I don't want you know, the kitty to jump on the counter. So you're thinking exactly what you don't want. And and I'm guilty too. That's why I know this because (laughs) I've done the same thing. I don't do it anymore, but it's really common. Mm -hmm. Any questions, mum? So can you communicate with living animals as well as, as those that are past? Of course. It's the same process. It's just for me, I got more enjoyment out of the afterlife communication. That brought me more joy. So I really became focused on those particular sessions, the afterlife communication, because most clients will come to me and they were very upset, as we know, because they had just lost one of their pets. And I would see them literally i could i could feel their heart mend just from one message that i delivered just one little message and you can actually feel that person start to come out of that dark place that that really terrible place that we've all been in just by delivering one message and i became addicted to that that feeling of of helping somebody move out of that place so i've I focused all my attention on afterlife communication and that became the majority of what I did. And that's why I wrote my book because of all of the amazing messages that I received, I wanted to share those with others so that they could see, Hey, you know, look, there is hope and there is healing for you. And all it takes is opening your heart and mind and, and, uh, and you can move into a place of healing. Must admit, we, when we had your book, we was listening to it on the Alexa. Um, that did help us. Well, that helped me big time. That helped me. Um, just, just the way you'd actually worded it was was amazing. It was, Thank it was you. easy. Sorry, I don't know. That. Sorry, that's my Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> they do that, don't they? They all start talking. You can't say the A word. <laughs> You have to spell her name out. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. Helped. I'm so glad. Now, did was it the stories? Was it the actual stories about 
what the animals shared or was it just the information about what happens when you're when a pet dies what was well, like, we, we listened to it right the way through and the first part with stories um yeah i could i could see that but it was the information afterwards um because obviously it was really raw with us because we'd lost our two and it was i could you know it, it was com you could communicate with it you could you could yeah see through it do, do you know what i mean yeah and I've, yeah. i just i mean i listened to it probably about three or four times five times maybe um i really enjoyed it thank i you. really did enjoy it i'm so glad see that just you just made my day thank you so oh, much to know that i helped you you just did by, yeah. just by sharing what i do just by sharing what i've learned just by saying hey this is what happens in a session and that's what I, like I said, I got hooked on that. That is such a wonderful feeling to know because I used to be that pet guardian that would try to keep an animal here as, as long as I could. You know, I would do everything under the sun. I would spend, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars and I would extend their life to the point of ridiculousness. Yeah. Because I, I was selfish. I didn't want to let them go. Yeah. And I don't do that anymore. Now, of course, I check mm. in with them and I say, you know, are you okay with staying here? Do you, are you ready to go? You know, what's your comfort level? So I have the ability to do that. But if you don't have the ability to connect the way that I do, they will give you signs. They will show you, they will, their eyes, they'll look at you in, in a certain way, or they'll start doing really weird things. Mm. Anything that's outside their normal behavior, those should be red flags for you that things are not okay. Things are changing and shifting within them. And it is up to us as the pet guardian to manage that and help them live the best life they can, but not to keep them here selfishly because we're not ready to make that decision. And I had to do it, I just had to do it two weeks ago. So I know the pain that comes with that. It's horrible. Yeah. And the guilt. And, and the guilt. guilt. Yeah, the guilt. And, the, and isn't that mm. something how even if they're really old and really failing, we still feel guilty. It, it's just natural, it's, it's normal. And we all feel that way. I second guess everything. Did I miss something? Especially me. This one caught me completely off guard. It was one of my senior kitties. She was close to 20. I had no idea that there was a kidney issue going on and look what I do for a living. So sometimes even for me, they fly under the radar. And we, we missed, yeah, we missed our 12 year old. We knew the 14 year old was on end of life care. The 12 year old, he started to lose a lot of weight, but we thought because the older one was on end of life care, we thought they'd always been together. It was stress. You know, you do. We totally didn't we, Darren? We totally missed the signs. Um, and it turned out it was liver cancer. Um, so for us, the, 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 the kindest thing would have was to have them. He, he could have gone on another month, two months. But they said that it would have that the cancer would have increased because of the loss of the other one that was going to, you know, is imminent, really. Mm. Um, and he would have been in so pain. We, it was, yeah. So we, we decided, we made that decision, didn't we, as a family, to have them together. Put, and you know what? That, that's beautiful, what, what you decided there, to have them together. And they truly appreciate that when we can... This is, this is so painful. I'm sorry. I've just had to do that's this. Fun. So... When we can help them before they go into crisis, when we mm. can help them leave their body when they aren't in crisis, they appreciate that yeah. so much. So if you have to plan ahead or at least get it in your mind that helping your pet leave its body before they're in that downward spiral where it's three o'clock in the morning and now you're scrambling to try to do something because you didn't want to make a decision two weeks ago. Mm. They really appreciate that. And it benefits everyone so much more. And trust me on this. They don't, the animals don't hold us responsible 
for ending their life. Not a single time have I ever heard from a, a pet in a session that they held their guardian responsible for ending their life, even when accidents happen and we literally cause. Yeah, that's what you said in your book. They that's don't see saying. it that way. That's a human concept. Emotion. Again, they're animals, we're human. They don't think the way we do. They don't rationalize in a human sense. They just know they're either in their body or they're not. Yeah, and very they much really in the don't, moment. Right, they don't sit there and weigh things out. Well, you should have done this. Well, why didn't you take me in sooner? Well, why didn't you give me the treatment? That's human. That's human yeah. animal. That's us. Yeah, that's, that's our that's our yeah. subconscious. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that's that's one way that humans can really learn from animals and and yes. children, young children who aren't in yes. that mind state. Because I mean, if you if you look look into a dog's eyes or a cat's eyes and you'll see just unconditional, you know, loyalty, unconditional love, yeah. and hu humans could benefit from that so much, especially in these this society now where it's every man for himself. Exactly, I've learned so much from them. I used to, like I said, keep them here way too long. I don't do that anymore. I used to wait until they were in crisis. I don't do that anymore. I used to be one of those uh, negative thinkers, like thinking everything I didn't want them to do. So I've learned so much from them and being in the moment, like you said, Darren, you know, we as humans are, we worry about yesterday. We worry about what's happening tomorrow or next week or, you know, next month. You know, animals are in the moment. They're right here, right now. And they are content as long as they're, comfortable and you know food water shelter and love and activity and you know we don't do that we don't ever just share that space with them and be in the moment of being with them we're we're too distracted anymore and and i've learned that so much that they've taught me to just be in the moment and to get out of my ego you know my ego is the side of my brain that you know, wants to blame myself when things don't go as I had hoped. That's the ego side, the left brain talking. And realize when something terrible happens, even if you, you have to make the decision quickly about your pet, that there is um, only love. Your pet has only love for you. No disdain, no um, thoughts of being disgruntled about anything. They have only love for you and they know that you have done everything that you can on their behalf and that's all that matters to them. Even if you have to make the decision, they know you did that out of love for them. Yeah, and, yeah, and they, it, they know, they feel the intention behind the action, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, you something, what? sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm just going to tell you something interesting that happened when Ty and Omi went, um, because there was there were or well, there was quite a significant synchronicity involved. So Ty was going downhill. We knew he had kidney failure. He was expected to live for uh, weeks, and he went six months on after that, and he'd been perfectly fine. He'd, he'd slowed down a great deal, and he was struggling to walk, but he, he was fine generally. Uh, Omi was you wouldn't have ever known anything was wrong um mum rang the vets one morning she just had off the spur of the moment decision or whim to you know ring the vets get him because we were getting a transfer from one vet to another um so we thought we'll ring him up see if they've got an appointment to check omi's teeth he wasn't eating and we knew that his teeth were bad so we assumed it might be something to do with that and um as it happened the vet had one open space that same day which was which very, is not heard of rare. at the moment that's not yeah. heard of at the moment so we, we took Omi down there for that that appointment that day and found out that he had the liver cancer um which was a it was a blow but we we came back and we both slept with him that night knowing we'd, we'd made the decision at that point that Ty's going downhill Omi if we leave him going he's just going to suffer and it's not fair and best for them to go together so we made that decision to have the vet come home to our house luckily oh, um, to nice. have them put down 
uh, and we'd, we'd organise that for the next day. And bear in mind, Ty, although he was a bit wobbly on his legs, struggling to keep his balance, he was perfectly fine. Eating everything. Eating absolutely fine. That morning, about four o'clock in the morning, he had a stroke. And um, he was just yeah, all over the place. He couldn't stand, couldn't even stand still, and he was really not, not with it. Um, and then a bit later that morning... Managed to calm morning, him, didn't we? Managed to calm him down, put him on the bed, slept with him. Then that morning... Um, he had an epileptic fit quite a, or a seizure you know a, a very seizure. big seizure mm. on the day that he was due to be put down and that was almost confirmation that now was the best time to do it and that yeah. only for only to go with him you know was the best thing i we we're pretty damn certain of that it, it was meant to be yeah it was meant to be absolutely and they can feel that they can sense that you know again it's on their level of sensing animals are very sensitive creatures so they can pick up on our intentions they can understand to a certain degree that we're going to help them leave their body and i've actually seen things happen where they they'll, i call it a healing crisis so let me explain so this is what's so hard when you're getting ready to make that decision, you know, should we let them go? Should we keep them here? You know, it's a roller coaster. There's ups and downs. They have good days and bad days. And it's so hard because you think, okay, they're having more bad days than they're having good days. I should probably let them go. Well, once we make that decision, and this is really, this has happened to me. This is so hard. You make the decision, you schedule the appointment, they suddenly bounce back to yeah. life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're eating, they're drinking, they're mm. jumping around, they're happy, they're animated, and you're going, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> I call that a healing crisis. And it's kind of what I figured out. It's kind of Mother Nature's one last boost, if you will, because it's survival, you know, the, the, the strongest survive, survival of the fittest and mother nature. It's like one last burst of energy from mother nature, but it's also to help them transcend and transition out of their body. So it's like one last boost, you know, just think about it this way. If you two were getting ready to go on a very long trip, you would make sure you had all your supplies, you would pack everything mm -hmm. up that you needed, you would top off the fuel tank and make sure you had plenty of gasoline or what to get where you're going. And it's kind of the same way. Mother Nature kind of packs all of that energy in there to make sure that they have everything they need to go out on their journey. So it's very confusing for us, the pet guardian, because we're like thinking, oh my gosh, you know, they're on death's doorstep one day and the next day after we schedule their appointment, they're running around like yeah. a puppy or a kitten again. And it can be very confusing because we think, okay, I'm canceling that appointment. And then what happens? You cancel the they're appointment and they go downhill. Humans do the same though, don't they? they do. humans will, you cannot have, you can have a human that's in hospital and, and really on their way. And then suddenly the next day they'll pick up and want to eat. Yes. Or be smiling and talking. And then you think. <laughs> yeah, that happened to your dad, didn't it, granddad? Yeah, that happened mm. to my dad and it happened to my nan. And then then literally within, you know, but then they get the death rattle straight after usually, don't they? They get a very severe downward spiral right after that. Because it's That's like right. I said, it's one last boost and then poof, they crash. That's right. So yeah. just be, be watchful if that's happening to you get ready because that crisis is going to come quickly yeah. they're going to go downhill really really fast so just when you're thinking oh you know we're out of the woods we're safe you know they're back to normal again mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. no it's usually very very quick after that that they say no i'm out of here i'm truly out of here so um gosh they've just taught me so much it's just amazing and and every one of each one of them is is so different and I ask this question of, of my clients, you know, for all the heartache that you went through, all the pain and the guilt and the grief and those horrible days, would you go through it again knowing how much they brought into your life, knowing the joys, knowing the happiness, the companionship, the love and everything they brought to you, 
would you be willing to go through it all if you knew ahead of time how much it was going to hurt when they left? Mm. I would. And I bet most of them say yes. Yeah. Most say yes. You know, we, we opt in when we bring them into our homes, we, we opt in for all of that. That includes having to say goodbye. We don't want to talk about it or deal with it, but that's Mm. part of the package because most of them will outlive us. So as much as we don't want to admit it, we kind of signed up for it. And then when, when that unfortunate time comes, you know, it's horrible and devastating. I've, I'm writing my next book right now and it's all about pet loss and the journey from that dark, dark place until you find healing again. So I'm interviewing clients about what their journey was like going from a loss and, and moving through all the different phases of grief. And it's so different for everyone. I haven't had two people say the same thing. And I I've, I've done about, 20 interviews so far, everyone has a unique story. Everyone felt something different. Some couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, couldn't function. Others overate or they obsessed about everything. You know, they went the opposite direction. You know, it's, it's so personal and so different and there's no rule book. You know, there's no right way or wrong way to experience grief or a loss. Some cry all the time some can't cry no matter how how hard they try the tears don't come you know there's just such a personal journey and again i'm learning so much about what everybody goes through and how very unique it is but i will add that i personally feel that every loss i have it makes me a better mom guardian yeah to my existing remaining future animals. I think it makes me better as as we found, we found that things that we should have done that we didn't do with the boys. Yes. um, That we would change. We would do it different. Yes. Haven't we Darren? Yeah. Yeah. We've learned, you know, the things we plan to do with the next one. When yeah. That, when that time comes, you know, I, I felt a lot of regret because I was always usually up here working when the boys were downstairs on their own or, or, or whatever. And you think that, that I must have wasted years worth of time that I could have right? had with them. You know? yeah. Yes, yeah. it does. It makes us look at our actions, our behaviors, how present, yeah. how present we were for them. Just it makes us, I think it opens us up to grow on a spiritual level, mm. on a caretaker level, I think it really helps us transform into a better person than mm. if they had not been in our life before. And as much as it hurts and as much as none of us want to go through it, you know, it really is beneficial on the level of your spiritual growth it's it's a beneficial experience mm. Mm. and, and there, find... there is positive but... that comes from it mm. do you find that um with your knowledge that um the animals survive the physical death and i imagine you also believe that they'll be there for us when we go um do, do you find that, that that knowledge helps at all with your own grief when you lose an animal um, you bleeped out on me there. Can you repeat that for me? Sorry. So we'll just establish first. Do you believe, which I imagine you do, that once um, once we die as well, we'll be reunited with our animals? Yes. So do you find that that knowledge that the animals survive, that the pets survive and that we'll see them again, does that alleviate any grief, do you find? Or does it help with the process? I think, <clears throat> again, I'm speaking personally here. I think for me, the older I get, I start to think more about my own mortality and how much time I have left and what am I going to do with the time I have left and how am I going to live the best life I can live. And I think knowing that my soul group will be there to greet me is so comforting. 
and makes me feel so good because it's like a big celebration. So when we lose someone here, we go into the depths of grief. On the other side, they're throwing a party. You know, they're wooting and hooting and yipping and skipping and woohoo, look who's here. It's nothing like what we go through. You know, we experience the, the human grief here on earth in this atmosphere. And once they leave their body, it's literally being launched. It, there are very few words that can describe it. It's so exhilarating. It's so complete and amazing and fulfilling. It's, it is an, a magical experience. And I can only try to describe to you what they're telling me and our words don't do it justice. But when, when they leave their body, human and animal alike, uh, it is truly a beautiful experience. And I have not had any situations happen at all where there's been any difficulty of somebody not crossing over or somebody being stuck or someone not wanting to go to the other side or however you, in heaven, whatever your beliefs are, I've never seen that. It's never happened. They come and visit us quite often. Yeah. They pop in, they pop out. You around your house, even if you move and you're not in the same place as when you had them, there are certain areas around you that are easier for them to go in and out of. We call these portals. And they will pop in and out through these portals and they will visit us in our dreams. They'll walk across our beds. They'll come in and sit by us next to the fireplace or the sofa or wherever in the kitchen when we're cooking, they're down there looking for little tidbits, just like when they were alive. And um, I'm getting a little sparkle in my forehead. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, a rainbow in the corner of your eye. <laughs> It's a, a crystal that's in my window. There, I have to go over here. So um, then I forgot what I was going to say. Um, what was I talking about? You're saying about signs? They come to visit you. That's what I was talking about. They yeah. come to so um, they, they get to continue their journey. So they, they're not around us 24-7. They want to oh. go explore, wouldn't you? Want to go check it out and see yeah. what's around and the great thing about the other side is that they're not bound to one place at one time like we are. If they want to go to three different places at once, they can. They don't, they're not limited like we are in physical. So energy can do that. It can be in multiple places at the same time. So they can follow you to work. They can follow you on a walk. They can follow you to the grocery store. You know, they can be anywhere that they want to be. And it's fun for them because they didn't get to do that before. So while we're here left grieving and in pain and experience all this horrible um, emotions, they're having the time of their life. And they're wondering, yeah. why, they're wondering why we're so sad. Why are they so sad? I know the boys, the boys have been to us several times right. and you sit in the lounge and you can smell them. Yes. That's, that's the living you know room. they're there and yes. it's, it's, that's very comforting. And didn't, didn't you say you saw um, you saw them move the curtain? Well, I was sitting there on my own. I, I, I don't care what anybody says. I was sitting there on my own. <laughs> there was nothing moving. There was no fans on. Nothing was on. And I, it was the first time we'd smelt them. And I thought, okay, am I, am I imagining this? So I said to them, look, if you are here, can you just show me your head? Just move the curtain. Which I know it sounds ridiculous, but... And it moved. That it curtain, sounds it, it, ridiculous it, to me. It sounds wonderful. It was amazing. And we had a reading done, didn't we, Darren, on the boys. And she came back with things that nobody would have known. I mean, Omi was very much in charge. He was very much, there's a bit of a tension going. I'm going to whack Omi out, uh, tie out of the way with my bottom. And I'm, I'm going to get the attention. And she was trying to do the reading on Ty. But she said the other one just kept pushing, pushing, pushing him out. So she's going to do the second one first, which was Omi. But she said that they're outside all the time. They love to be outside. Well, they were ratters. They wouldn't make great farm dogs, really good farm dogs. And we used to rat them over on the farm fields and they loved it. And she said they just don't want to ever come in. They just want to stay outside. And I thought, yeah, that's mm -hmm. them. 
I'll that's tell it. you. I'll tell you another in- interesting thing that's happened as well. Yeah. After they went, I asked them um, to send me uh, foxes because they're my favourite animals. I got one behind me there. Um, not a real one, unfortunately. But I asked them to send me foxes because we've been living in this same house now for twenty three years. I've mm-hmm. never seen I've never seen a fox around the area. Um, and I asked them send me a tame fox, you know, one that will come up and say hello. That never happened, but. Um, the first time we went out, I think we went out for a walk at night, a couple of days after I'd asked them, and there goes one shooting across the road. That's the first one I've seen in 23 years. And I thought, okay, we, we, we very seldom go out walking at night. Maybe I just haven't been out, and therefore we haven't seen them, but they have always been there. So I thought, okay, fair enough. It wasn't tame. Um, I think two or three days following that, we went out on a walk again, and a second one shoots out in front of us in, across the road. And I thought, okay, this is getting a bit unusual now. Two is a bit a bit far-fetched to say it's a coincidence but maybe it might be um then uh, again a few days after that uh, dad came out with us on the walk as well and i thought yeah whenever dad's with us nothing interesting ever happens so if if, if you send me a fox now that will be pretty spectacular and i think it was about three minutes after i thought <coughs> that bang the closest one to us goes running across the road <laughs> yeah. and i thought okay okay this this is now getting a little bit strange <laughs> and I, that that then kind of mostly convinced me um and since then i haven't thought about them sending me anything and we we've been out for a walk every night and we've never seen one since and that was about you know, it's been about three weeks now after seeing three in two weeks and i thought that's that's pretty incredible that, you know even the laws of coincidence that just blows it right out of the water i mean what are the chances after you living there that long and you know it's that's what they do, they send us a sign, they send us signs all the time, and it's up to us to pay attention and to recognize the sign, because think about it, they don't have a body anymore. So all they can do is manipulate what is around us. So they will do whatever they can to manipulate whatever is around us to get our attention and to let us know they're there. It could be the same thing every time. I have some clients that they'll see feathers all the time, like, and they don't have a pet bird, and they'll go in their bedroom and there's a feather laying there on the pillow or something, or they'll walk outside of their doctor's office and there's a feather on the floor or whatever. And, you know, these signs, if you pay attention and if you get really excited and ask for more signs, they will send more and more and more and more. But if you discount them, if you say, oh no, that's just coincidence, that's just a fluke, that's just, you know, weird then they won't try as hard because why should they? It takes a lot of energy to send us a sign and they don't have a body. All they can do is manipulate our environment. So they're going to use whatever ability they can to do that. Some you might hear them, maybe a scratching sound or a whining, crying, barking, meowing or whatever you might hear. You know, others will actually, you'll hear the little click, click, click on the floor with their nails as they click on the floor. I mean, there's so many different ways that they can send us a sign if you just pay attention and ask them for a sign and then be really excited when it happens and thank them. Say, God, thank you so much. That was awesome. Do it again. Do it again. They love it when we acknowledge that. The other thing the lady was saying, the, <clears throat> the medium was saying that we started, when we lost them, we started going for these walks. Nobody knew that because we started off going at sort of 10 o'clock at night. And she said, oh, the boy said, well, she, she contacted me via Facebook and she said, the boys are here with me and they want to thank you so much for the walk. They really enjoyed that walk last night. Nobody knew that we took him out, we, that we went out for walks. That was before and anybody she, knew, She specified it? the time as well. Yeah, 10 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, it's 10 o'clock. That's the kind of see, that's proof to me. That's proof. Yeah. That's not anything else other than proof that you're getting the message from your pets because mm. no one else knew it. You hadn't told anyone, you hadn't posted it anywhere, you weren't sharing right. it with anyone. And this is what happens time and time again. So, you know, for those people who are skeptical, I understand skepticism, and I think everyone should have a healthy skepticism. But when you've done this as long as I have, it is so overwhelming how many messages come through that cannot in any way, shape or form otherwise have been known to me. Uh, it's, there's no way to, to, I could have received that information. Mm. Can, you, can, you give, can you give an example of what maybe it was one of the more memorable experiences of that that you had? 
Oh my gosh, I have so many. Let me think. Um, <clears throat> okay, this is a really good one. <clears throat> Let me get past this. I have a beautiful you get, crystal. You're adding, yeah, you're getting three so rainbows on you now. I have my window and the sun's hitting it just perfectly right now. Uh, I had a client that was uh, very distraught. She had, unfortunately, uh, on her way to work, she was backing out of her garage and she backed over her cat. And uh, the, it didn't kill the cat, but it injured it. And, and it never made it, uh, it didn't survive the injuries. So all I knew is the cat had passed on. I didn't know anything else about it. And I'm on the phone. I'm not zooming with her. I'm just on the phone. And uh, I kept hearing from the cat to talk about the an amputated leg. Well, this woman was already very distraught. So I didn't want to bring it up because I thought, you know, why should I bring that up? You know, she, the cat's gone it's on the other side it's doing great you know it sent all these great messages I just I just didn't want to upset her and the cat was insistent kept sending it over and over again amputated leg talk about the leg amputated leg so for, I have this rule if I hear a message three times I have to say it that's my rule so I heard it like five or six times I was like okay <laughs> I will say it so I told her I'm so sorry that I have to bring this up but your cat is just insisting did he lose a leg because he keeps telling me to talk about an amputated leg and she said starts crying so it's, then it's like oh great you know <laughs> look what I've done and she said oh my gosh Karen oh my gosh I can't believe you just said that I can't believe it well I'm thinking I'm a horrible person now I've made her feel even worse look what I've done and oh my gosh I should have just kept my big mouth shut and she's like, no, 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 you don't understand. You just helped me so much. You just totally helped me so much. And I thought, what did I do? Well, it turns out that three months after her cat passed, she was in a horrific accident and she had her leg amputated. And you wouldn't have known that because you were on the phone to her. Mm. Hmm. So yeah, immediately uh, where my thoughts went, we she backed over the cat, and the cat then had to have its leg amputated. That's Maybe where I first I went thought. to. Yeah. So and I suppose everyone totally. would, but that's a bit of a twist. Yeah. Totally what I thought, and I was like, I'm not going to bring that up. That's horrible. I'm not going to bring it up. And the cat's like, No, you need to talk about the amputated leg. So I did. Well, in that moment, if you can imagine, she went from the deepest, darkest place of guilt to being absolutely positively feeling relieved of all of that stress because this cat was more concerned about her health, her well-being, her amputation, her accident than anything she did to him in the accident. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all that guilt indeed. she was holding yeah. on to was just disappeared in that moment right there on the phone with me. And that is what drives me that captured right there the essence of the power animal communication has whether you are open to it or not it doesn't matter if you're that person and you're hurting and somebody delivers a message to you that there's no way they could have possibly known this in any other way shape or form you know there is undeniable proof right there that you have somebody sending you a message right there it's just mind-boggling when you say you um you heard the cat saying to you say amputated leg how were you hearing that was it an, an audible voice that you could hear through the ears or was it a, a thought um i am mainly clear audience so i hear i train myself to hear the messages i also get visual and I get feelings, but I'm primarily clairaudient. So, so it's if someone's stood there next to you talking physically. I always hear it on my right side as if they're right behind me talking in my ear, but it's not my outer ear. It's like an inner ear. It's like an internal ear, but it's always to my right. I always feel it coming into my right side. I don't know if that's because it's a right brain thing. I don't know. 
but it just always comes in from my right hand side. And that's also how I know that it's not my thought. My thoughts are primarily on my left side, but when it comes from an animal, especially during a session, I feel it coming in from the right hand side. Do you hear it as your own voice or as yes. a separate voice? As your own voice, you know, as a whisper or just a general kind of talking? It is like a thought. Like if you thought right now, I need to go to the store and buy a gallon of milk. It's just like that in my mind. So it's not loud, it's not quiet, it's just like a regular thought in your mind. It's very clear and it is unmistakable. And many times a message will come through and I don't have a clue like that one. I don't have a clue what it means. I can assume, I can guess, but ultimately that message is meant for whoever I'm doing the session for and it's not meant for me to understand it. Although I will tell you a little twist here. I've been doing this for so long that I've developed a, a series of symbols that I use during a session. So for instance, if a particular animal is having a hard time relaying a message to me, I have symbols that they can use so that I understand what they're talking about. So for instance, if there's a blood issue, I'll see a drop of blood, like a bright red, perfect drop of blood. If there's a heart issue, I will either feel pain in my chest or I will see the outline of a heart. But it is something that I've developed over many, many years. And uh, this, this helps the transmission of messages if I'm not quite getting it because I can be thick headed <laughs> sometimes and, uh, and not get the message right. And the animals get frustrated with me because I'm not getting it right. So they let me know, hey, that wasn't what I was trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you something else. So I asked them to use different symbols for me. And, uh, and that really works in certain situations. If someone has uh, diabetes, for instance, I'll see a little uh, syringe with a tiny little needle, or I'll see a little bottle of insulin. And there's all kinds of different, I use uh, red light, yellow light, green light. So a red light is a no, a yellow light is a caution and a green light is a yes or go forward. So there's all kinds of little symbols that, like that, that so help. How, how do you differentiate between um, the thoughts that arise as a communication versus just spontaneous thoughts in your own mind? How do I differentiate? years and years and years of doing this. <laughs> so when I'm in a session, I'm very focused. I raise my vibration with meditation and different objects here in my office. For instance, um, I always uh, prepare the same way every single time. Like I use Palo Santo, which is a cleansing. It's like smudging. I also have various crystals this is a, a quartz that I have from Ireland right here. And uh, I have amethyst and different things on my desk. And uh, I also use um, my, my secret weapon. I can't show it to you because it's just off camera. My secret weapon is a big, gigantic pack of batteries. Want to guess why? Um, because <laughs> they, they store your they store your energetic charge and can be passed back to you? The animals need fuel to send me a message. Where does that fuel come from? If they pull it from me, I'm already using all my energy just to connect with them. And if they pull it from their human, their human may or may not be able to fill them up with fuel, especially if they're in pain, if, if they're grieving. So I get a gigantic pack of batteries and I set it on my desk and I tell them before the session starts, I tell the animals, cause I always check in with them first. I tell them you can use the fuel and the energy from these batteries to send me messages. That's my secret weapon. So, so the, spirit, the spirits can almost, you know, convert chemical energy into usable energy from, from their point of view. Yes. And the way that I came about this was uh, I started doing paranormal investigations with uh, at haunted locations. And we would go in 
with uh, brand new batteries in our digital voice recorders, in our cameras, in our flashlights, brand new batteries. And when you walk into a highly active paranormal location, all your batteries will be drained. As soon as you walk in, it's like, mm. yeah. <laughs> a lot of people say that. So I thought about this and I went, hmm, what a great way to give the animals an extra boost of energy having a battery pack right on my desk that they can pull their energy from. And it works with a human departed human sessions too. In my mediumship work, I tell the humans they can pull their energy from those batteries. So I charge up my office before the session. I make sure that it's supercharged, but as time goes by, it's kind of like treading water. Pretty soon you get tired. Pretty soon your energy level starts to drop. The animal's energy starts to drop. A departed human energy start to drop and everything starts to kind of you know, go lower and lower. So this is a great way to boost everybody back up again. And I love it because it works and it's easy and they can manipulate that energy and turn it into fuel very, very quickly. How often do you have to change your batteries then? <laughs> often, you know? if I'm busy, <laughs> quite often, like, you know, every couple of weeks when I'm busy. Uh, have you I ever have tested to see if they run out. You know, I don't. I don't. I just throw them into a recycle bin. I don't test them, but I can tell because I can tell that the batteries are getting low because the the messages come through. Uh, thinner and thinner, lighter right, and lighter. Right, because they're getting less energy to less draw on from the dead batteries. Yeah. Right. Yes. So yep. I just go in and get a whole new pack of batteries, and I'm good to go. Do you ever go shopping, and then you get that spirit pushing for, say, a lady over in the corner? Oh yeah, I was on a I was on an airplane one time, and I was coming back from a, a psychic show that I was doing and I was in like the second or third seat it was a very small plane so it was just two two seats and I kept hearing this woman a spirit of a woman trying to get my attention hey you she kept saying hey hey you hey and I was ignoring her because I was tired and I'd been working all weekend doing sessions. And I was like, sorry, I'm closed. <laughs> and I kept sending her away and she kept coming back and she started poking me. She was poking me in the shoulder. And then she kept showing me a, a very severe scar on her chest and like open heart surgery. I could see this, this open wound on her chest. She was see-through you know, she's a typical spirit, I could see through her, but I could see that there was a chest incision on her chest. And she kept saying to me, you need to tell my son that I'm okay. <laughs> did, did you put this one in the book? I remember reading this or something very similar. Mm -hmm. yeah. You need to tell my son I'm okay. And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't know who your son is. Go clocked away. Off at five. <laughs> and, it's and clocked off said, at five o'clock. <laughs> Sorry about the little dog, by the way. We're looking after her for a week. Her oh, owner's not very cute. well. So she says he's back there. And I look back and there's, you know, a whole plane full of people behind me. And I said, I'm sorry, but I don't know which one he is. And she said, he's back there. His name is Mark or Mike. I can't remember. And as I look back, there was a giant M floating over this one man's head. Oh, my God. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to walk up to a total stranger and tell him his, his, his name. Mom. First of all, that would freak him out. That would totally freak him out. So, yeah, so that happens. And then, you know, I've been in grocery stores where, like you said, you know, anywhere where there's you know other people, public places, anywhere, you know, the spirits are following them around. We're, there's spirits everywhere. They're not trying to scare us. They don't mean to scare us, but, you know, they're looking over us. They're watching over us and seeing what we're doing and. They can be anywhere. You just have to uh, be sensitive enough to pick up on their energy and sense got, their around. Common, a common question on mediumship, which um, just to go over to that slightly, is why, especially with television mediums, um, often who charge extortionate amounts for private readings, they always say to a, to a group or an individual, I'm getting someone someone's name beginning with the letter M, beginning with the letter D. And the question is, why... why 
do the spirits just give them a letter? Oh, do they not? you know, Darren, it's so frustrating as a medium because that's why I like working with animals. I'll get actual names from animals. Animals will give me people's names or something similar to, to the name. Um, for instance, I will see my grandmother. Sometimes she's passed, but I'll see her come through and it's not her coming through, but it, it means I'm either supposed to say grandmother or I'm supposed to say a grandmother energy greeted them or someone by the name of Jean is significant or someone by the name of Jean greeted them. So they'll use that some symbolism like I shared with you earlier, but back to your question, why don't they just give us the answers? I don't know. There must be some kind of filtration system and I'm totally guessing right now as to why they don't just give us answers, straightforward answers. They talk in riddles and rhymes sometimes. Yes. Well, well it, it, not even just given answers, but given you know a specific name rather than a letter. I don't this know. Is, this, is, this is why I'm always extra skeptical of, of TV mediums or mediums that work that way. I mean, I've got a friend who's, um, his wife is a medium and, and he was telling me about an experience he had with her where she channeled someone that he knew, a friend, and she was getting, you know, his name, his mother's name, spot on, you know, no, oh, I think it sounds like Jean, it sounds like, is right. it Jean or Jim or Jim? No, right. she got it straight on, it's this, it's that, it's this, it's this. And why, you know, why can't that be possible? I'll for... tell you, I'll tell you what happens to me. And again, I'm speaking from experience here. <clears throat> when I do a human communication session, there's a vibration like the blades of a fan, they rotate, okay? The energy rotates. So if you think about the blades of a fan, if it's going really, really fast and you're trying to listen and tune into what they're saying, they only come around close to you once every rotation, okay? On that once rotation, you might just hear a blip and then they're gone again until they come back around again. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So that could be because it's the rotation of the energy. That's how it is to me. When I first, first started trying to connect with departed humans, I could only hear little blips. And I was like, what the heck is this? It was like they were on a merry-go-round and I could only hear them when they came back around again. And I think that may be part of it because of our atmosphere that we can only get little snippets and bits and pieces. And I will say that when the pressure is on and you're trying too hard and the cameras are on and everyone's staring at you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I it's can not easy. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> it's really not easy. If I'm sitting quietly right here in my office and I have plenty of time to check in and relax and breathe and invite the spirits to come in, it's a whole lot easier than being under the spotlight and having everyone stare at you and, and have time limits and, you know, it's, it's not easy what we do. There's a lot of work that goes into it. There's a lot of focus and concentration and it really is a skill. It's a talent. It's a skill. And it, the more you do it, the better you get obviously over time. And I think that some people just are more able to tune into certain things. Like I'm clairaudient. So I hear things better. Some people may be more clairvoyant, so they may see things. They may see little mini movies playing. They may be able to tell you, you know, see what you had for breakfast this morning because they're watching you eat it. You know, I might just hear that you had, you know, cereal and toast or something. So it also goes with each individual person and, and where their skill level is and where they've developed that um, intuitive ability. But I get frustrated even with um, a friend of mine. Um, he has some spirits in his house that are constantly, they're, they're harmless, but they're constantly opening up, opening a door in his guest room. And it's a brand new house, brand new house. They just moved in first owners, brand new house. So it's not like the house is haunted. So he did an EVP session and he asked them straight up, why are you opening the door? They won't tell him. They won't answer him. They won't. <laughs> I've asked them, what do you need? Do you need something? Or you, you're obviously trying to get our attention. They won't answer me. The spirit pranksters. 
Exactly. They, yeah, they have their own <laughs> agenda and it doesn't yeah. always align with our agenda. It's frustrating, but mm. I, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get mum to a private one on one reading. You won't do it, will you? <laughs> <laughs> You'd freak you out too much. I've been to a couple and it's, it's, a couple of them were quite you know, cold reedy. One of them was very good. So I'd love, I'd, you know, I'd love to take you to one one day, but you won't, will you? Probably not. We went to a group <laughs> one though, didn't we? Went to a group one. Yeah. We'd go to a group one, um, but nothing. It was nothing for us, was there? But no. it's, it's knowing who to trust, isn't it? It's, it is. It's, yeah. it's there. There are frauds to, out there. It's knowing who to trust, and you know, realizing too that you know, even for me, I had good days, and I had you know, days where I would struggle to get information. And there's so much that goes into it. It's your energy, what you bring to the session has so much to do with how the session goes. You know, if you're positive and excited and open just to receive whatever information comes through, you're going to have a much better session than if you're someone going, oh, this is all a bunch of hooey and I don't believe it. And I'm, or I'm freaked out and this is going to scare me you're not going to have as good of a session because that's what you're bringing to the table. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Seeking Eye Life Exploration Podcast. If you did and would like to continue following my research, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel and following the podcast on Podbean, iTunes, Spotify and other podcast providers. You can also join our Facebook discussion group. You can find the link to this and other Seeking Eye online profiles at seeking-eye.com. Thank you.